What would you do if you had the opportunity to interview Jesus? Pilate did. When Pilate was questioning Jesus, he asked, what is truth? But Pilate never stuck around for the answer. However, that should not stop us. We in our day can ask Christ the same question, what is truth, and go to the Word of God for our answer. The Pilot's Interview Podcast will investigate the truths of the Word of God and host interviews or discussions with theologians, pastors, and historians. This podcast is available on the following platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Video recordings of the podcast will be uploaded to YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Today we have the honor of hosting Miss Lita Kosner. Miss Kosner has a Bachelor of Arts degree, summa cum laude, in Biblical Studies from Oklahoma Wesleyan University and a Master of Arts, cum laude, in New Testament Greek from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, her thesis being Jesus the Honorable Broker, a social, scientific exegesis of Matthew 15, 21 through 28. Ms. Costner is the author of the book From Creation to Salvation and has co-authored How Did We Get Our Bible, Gay Marriage, Right or Wrong, and Creation Restored, The New Heavens and Earth with Dr. Bates. She was the editor of the book Evolutionists Say the Oddest Things, and the presenter of the lecture Creation in the New Testament. Ms. Cosner, in part, became a Christian because of CMI and currently serves as an information officer and author for Creation Ministries International with over 400 articles under her belt in Creation Magazine, Journal of Creation, or in response to questioners. Ms. Cosner speaks for CMI at conferences, seminars, and specialist women events. Now, without further ado... Good morning, Ms. Costner. How was your day and how are you doing? Good morning. I'm doing well, thank you. Hey, it's a pleasure to have you on. And now let's move on to our first question. Ms. Costner, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 8, verses 8 through 9, all the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing forward or perverse in them. They're all plain to him that understandeth and right to them that find knowledge. May you plainly tell us, does the New Testament support the idea of a six-day creation and thus imply the earth is approximately 6,000 years old? Yes. To put it simply, the New Testament teaches the authority and inspiration of the Old Testament. If we relied solely on what the New Testament explicitly teaches, we would be left with some gaps. But that's because Jesus and the New Testament authors assume that Christians have access to and believe the Old Testament. So they didn't have to rewrite Genesis. However, if we look at what the New Testament explicitly teaches, we see that the New Testament authors quote Genesis 1 through 11 over 60 times. And they quote each chapter of Genesis 1 through 11. And in no place do they contradict the teaching of Genesis 1 through 11 or any other part of scripture. And I cover this much more in much more depth in my book, From Creation to Salvation. Oh, that's fantastic. And so, Ms. Costner, you just made it clear that you are a biblical, or sometimes called young earth, creationist. Along this same line of thought, in an article called Genesis as Ancient Historical Narrative, you wrote, I identify Genesis chapters 1 through 11, indeed the book of Genesis as a whole, as ancient historical narrative. Each word in this term is important. This doesn't dispute that there are poetic elements with the typical parallelism that characterizes Hebrew poetry. However, they always involve someone speaking. For example, the climaxes in Genesis chapters 1 and 27 to verse 23, so by God, by Adam, and 4 verses 23 to 24 by Lamech. These just reinforce the contrast between the quoted poetry of the speakers and the main narrative text. Ms. Costner, while it is clear that the grammar of the book of Genesis is indicative of historical narrative, does the grammar of the New Testament support the idea of a six-day creation and a 6,000-year-old earth? Well, grammatically speaking, it's the grammar of Genesis chapters 1, 5, and 11 that give us six days and 6,000 years. 
The New Testament affirms but does not repeat this teaching, and the primary argument from the New Testament for relatively young earth would be the genealogy in Luke 3, which links Jesus with Adam. The number of generations there indicates a thousands of years old um, time span between Adam and Jesus and not millions of years. Also, Paul's reference to the historical Adam in Romans 5, 12 through 21 and 1 Corinthians 15 would also require a young earth. Now, actually, speaking of creation, the fact that there is a creation indicates that there is a creator. Miss Costner, in an article called Discussing the Trinity, you stated, I regard the Trinity as a most beloved doctrine. And so I am happy to explain to you why I believe that God is one being consisting of three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. These three exist eternally, equal in power, glory, and deity. Before creation, God existed eternally in a state of perfect fellowship and love within himself. Miss Costner, does the New Testament reveal the identity of the creator of the book of Genesis? The New Testament confirms that God is the creator, but it, it also gives us an important Trinitarian revelation. Jesus is repeatedly said to be the one through whom God the Father created all things. John says, without him was not anything made that was made. And Paul says in Colossians 1 verses 16 through 17, for by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things hold together. So this revelation of the creative work of the son of God as the agent of creation is what different differentiates Trinitarian Christians from the Unitarian monotheistic religions of Judaism and Islam. And so this is one area where the New Testament really gives us a new revelation on top of what we're given in Genesis. Well, actually, speaking of the authority of Jesus, Miss Costner, in a talk you gave called Creation in the New Testament and Why It Matters, you said the primary reason we should believe Genesis is because Jesus did. And Jesus is the creator. So when Jesus says something about creation, that should give us incredible confidence. Likewise, in an article called, I'm a New Testament Christian, Genesis provides the litmus test for the basis of Christian belief. You and Dr. Bates concluded, New Testament Christians are ironically operating from a view that did not exist in the minds of New Testament authors. The Old and New Testament come together to tell one story covering the broad sweep of history. Ms. Costner, in light of the fact that the Old Testament is the foundation to the New Testament, does how one interpret the book of Genesis have any eschatological implications? Yes, it does. And many people miss this because they read the Bible as if it's co composed of separate so stories that don't have much to do with each other. So Eden is read as if it's disconnected from Abraham, which is then disconnected from Jesus and Paul. But the Bible is actually presenting a unified grand narrative of creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. If Adam was the actual first man who sin actually brought death into creation, then it makes sense that Jesus' sacrificial death and triumphant resurrection lays the groundwork for the future consummation in which creation reaches the goal that God planned for it before he created. But if Adam is just allegorical or if death was around for millions of years before any person could have existed, then one also has to interpret the consummation passages non-literally. You can't consistently have one with the, without the other. So how you interpret Genesis is incredibly important for your eschatology. Now, actually, so we just covered how an incorrect understanding of the book of Genesis has major eschatological ramifications. But let's see if the book of Genesis affects the rest of the theology in the scriptural canon. 
Miss Costner in an article called The Global Flood According to the New Testament. You penned the New Testament authors rarely reference the Old Testament for its own sake. They assume basic belief of the Old Testament scriptures. Rather, they are raising the historical events to use as examples or precedents to support their theological arguments. Along that same vein, in an article called Paul's View of Literal Adam, you wrote, Paul is using a typology in this passage which requires Adam and Christ to be equally historical. He's arguing that both individuals acted in ways that had real and lasting consequences in human history. Miss Costner, how does Adam being a genuine historical figure affect Paul's theological argument concerning salvation? Well, in Romans 5, 12 through 21, Paul links Adam's sin with how we're saved in Christ. So when he's explaining how salvation works, he says that we're saved in Christ the same way that we fell in Adam. He's presenting Adam and Christ as two great heads of humanity. And all of us are born under Adam, so we're under the condemnation of sin. But when we trust in Christ, we are counted as his. And so if Adam was an allegorical person whose actions didn't actually affect us, then Paul's comparison falls apart. If Adam was not literally the reason why we're condemned, then how can Christ actually be the reason we can be saved? Now, that's a very astounding argument. And so we've seen that the historicity of Adam then has salvific implications. So while it is true to transition that Adam was in fact a historical figure, it's also unfortunately true that his fall was a historical event. We'll now consider if the fall has implications for human worth. In an article called, Did the Fall Destroy? God's image in man, you wrote, the image of God is also the basis for the inherent wrongness of killing a human being. But in God's institution of capital punishment for murder, the express reason that is given is, for in the image of God, God created man. Now, some people say, yeah, he created, past tense, us in his image, but we lost it at the fall. There's nothing that says we've still got his image. Yes, it is in past tense, but the past tense doesn't negate the present possession of his image. And frankly, the command doesn't make much sense if we're no more in God's image than anything else. If the image was lost at the fall, then why is it not permissible to now kill human beings or abort babies, for example? Miss Costner, how should human beings view themselves? and treat one another in light of the fact that we are a fallen people. Well, I think one of the most important things is that we have to affirm that every person is created in the image of God. There are there have been any number of attempts to argue that certain groups of people, the unborn, minorities, whoever are less valuable, less in the image of God. And the Bible strongly refutes this. So our view on everything from pro-life to anti-racism is based on the fact that all human beings are created in the image of God and have equal worth and dignity. For Christians, one way this works out is also realizing that that the gospel is for every person and everyone equally needs to be saved. And so as Christians, we should be engaged in evangelism and be working to spread the gospel t- throughout the whole world in our own communities and in, uh, in distant countries through missions. Well, actually, Ms. Costner, speaking of evangelism, we've now come to our final question. In a sermon I preached called The Perfect Mold, Reflecting Jesus, Not Idolizing Man, I presented one of my favorite quotes from one of the greatest Protestant reformers. John Huss said, I maintain this for certain, 
that the image of Christ will never be effaced. They have wished to destroy it, but it shall be painted afresh in all hearts by much better preachers than myself. While it is important, as John Huss said, to have preachers speaking the truth, should the spreading of the message of the gospel be left to the preachers? Miss Costner, in an article you wrote called The Pope on Evolution, you said, Roman Catholics consider Pope Francis, or Jorge Mario Bergoglio, to be the successor of the Apostle Peter and therefore as having authority over Christians worldwide. Protestant creationists today have another reason to be glad that we reject this error. You went on to say, in fact, Francis, in his acceptance of the evolutionary theory, might have done more harm than good because those who wrongly look to him as a source of authority, of spiritual authority, they might be discouraged by his compromise and lose trust in the Bible. So in light of the fact that high-profile religious figures, such as Pope Francis, have accepted the evolutionary theory, what can individual Christians do to teach the everlasting gospel which affirms that God made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water? Well, I think the most important first step is to be confident in one's own faith. Far too many Christians go out to engage the enemies of Christianity with a shaky foundation, and that can be dangerous. Each Christian should ensure that he or she is studying scripture, is active in a local Bible-believing church, and that they're growing spiritually. And then they'll, they'll be ready to defend their beliefs and to share their faith with others. And many Christians who have been convinced of the importance of biblical creation make every spiritual conversation a confrontation about creation. But that's not necessarily the wisest or most strategic course, because somebody could theoretically believe that God created in six days, 6,000 years ago. But if they don't call on Jesus as Lord and Savior, they they won't be saved. So in conversations with non-Christians, we should be ready to deal with objections surrounding creation and evolution. But we should move them to the gospel as quickly as possible, because that's the central issue. And the reason why creation is a gospel issue is that it's one of the main reasons why people reject the faith today. We, we have testimonies from street evangelists who say that it's the number one issue that people bring up. They don't believe the Bible because they think that evolution has disproved creation. And so being equipped with those resources, many of which are available on creation.com, um, is really vital, but getting out there and sharing your faith is the best thing that Christians can do. And um, a lot of people are intimidated about it. They fear rejection, but when you actually get out there and start doing it, it's not as scary as a lot of people think. Amen. Thank you, Miss Costner, for your time. It was an absolute joy. And To our listeners, thank you for taking the time to search with us for the truth on Pilate's interview. You can find Ms. Costner's biography, books, articles, and lecture in the video description. Please share and subscribe to the Pilot's Interview podcast. It's available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Thanks again for listening, and remember, the truth saves.